So good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar brought to you by the Alberta Canola Producers, the Alberta Pulse Growers, and the Alberta Barley Commission. Joining us from Chile today is Sarah Foster. She's the Senior Seed Analyst with the uh, with 2020 Seed Labs at Anisku, Alberta, and she's going to run through a seed quality review for us now. I'll just turn it over to Sarah. Hello, everyone, and hola from Chile. I hope that... Uh uh, we're not going to experience too much of a, a time delay and that you can all hear me really well because I'm very excited to be able to be speaking to you in English um, all the way from Chile. So thank you Rick and the Alberta Canola Producer Commission for inviting me today. Um, as all of you know, um, it's been one of the most challenging years we've had in seed testing since 2003. And I've prepared a number of slides. I know that this actually is a hosting for the Canola Producer Commission. Um, but I've prepared a number of different slides um, for all the typical things that we've been seeing in the seed lab for the year two, 2010 and 2011. Um, let's talk about canola. Um, this is an example of treated canola. And it represents what we would see as the final test that's done on canola in Canada before it's bagged and sold. And this is a typical example of how we would conduct a germination on canola. It's a seven-day official germination on a treated sample. This germination is exceptional. And I would say that it's well over the grade minimum. And just a quick look at this, I would actually say that we probably have close to 100% germination. And again, taking a closer look, you can see that uh, we used a light blue blotter. It allows us to see if there are any defects with the seed and any defects with the seedlings, such as um, diseases perhaps that would show up either on the um, radical or the hypercotyl or the cotyledon. And in this case, um, we absolutely have a, a perfect example of how canola should look on a good germination. And as I said before, this represents the final test that is conducted on canola in Canada. And it ends with treated seed that is usually tested in the year that it is sold. So the germination is very current. Now, as I've said, it's the final test, which is usually um, one of 12 different tests that may be conducted on canola at three different stages of production um, in the canola process. It starts naturally um, with harvest, and preliminary testing is conducted at harvest time, where usually a preliminary purity and a germination and a disease screen are conducted. So that's the first step that uh, we use to assess the quality of canola. Then it's cleaned, and that typically happens, it all goes well, um, usually before December, and it's tested again. And at this point, it's put into more rigorous testing where we would start to conduct bigger testing and different stress tests to ensure that it's actually living up to the germination that um, we say that it actually has. And then it finishes out with another germination and another stress test after it's been treated. This is one of the many examples of a stress test. And actually, this is a direct stress test. On the left, we have the stress test, which is um, that the sample has been put either through heat or cold or high moisture, any one of those stresses will actually cause the seed to slow down. And that's the whole point of a stress test, is to try and emulate what may or may not happen in, in the field. On the right, we have a germination test that's been conducted under optimum conditions, usually at 20, 15 to 25 or 20 degrees centigrade depending on what part of the world you're testing in and under what conditions or protocol that you're using. Naturally in Canada we test uh, with the methods and procedures and this is what we've 
followed here. Now, this is an actually, actually is an example of our controlled deterioration test, which is one of the accredited tests that we have um, through the International Seed Testing Association. And what we're demonstrating here is that this is a textbook case of how we would want our canola to look after it's been through one of the most rigorous stress tests that we can actually put onto this canola. So we've subjected this seed to high humidity and high heat for a period of time that's been determined to actually kill the canola. And kill is the operative word here. And as we haven't succeeded in doing that, you can see that this seed is very, very vigorous and will withstand many, uh, many an issue that could potentially be a problem with this year's um, seeding. Now, what we look for, um, as I've said, we spend a lot of time with our canola, making sure that we've got the synchronous germination, but other crops are equally as important, and we look for synchronous germination with them too. Synchronous means when germination takes place all at the same time. So what we're looking for here is rapid, uniform emergence. Very, very important in getting a good stand establishment as quickly and as early as possible. And here we have an example of how we put our wheat seed onto a blosser. In Canada, we, we test 200 seeds, and so we replicate it um, twice, so 100 on each blosser, and we use a white blotter. Again, the reason for that is to make sure that if there are any um, issues, we can see them very, very clearly. What we have here is an example of healthy wheat seedlings. And this isn't necessarily typical of what we've been seeing this year, because we've had many, many challenges with very, a, a wide, a wide um, selection of different um, of problems. And here we have, as I say, a healthy wheat seedling. All of these have actually developed, and we're looking at potentially having a germination that's well over 90%. And here we have healthy barley seedlings. And again, on the white blotter, what we're looking at here is um, lovely green shoots, well-developed roots, and very, very clean background. So it's important that you just um, keep that in the back of your mind that we're seeing a white background here, and everything here is looking very, very healthy and very, very clean. And usually, um, in most years, this is typically what we see. Um, rarely do we see um, any of the issues that we've had this year. And normally, we can um, deal with most, most issues very, very well. But as I go through this presentation, you'll see that um, there's certainly been some struggles both for our customers and people growing seed in Canada, but also for the analysts. And I think, um, when I speak uh, for myself, I'm also speaking for other analysts in Canada who could also be experiencing, or, or I know, are experiencing the same thing. I'd have to say that this is the number one issue that we have had this year. And this is dormancy on wheat. And dormancy typically isn't a problem because it can actually be broken very successfully with a number of different dormancy breaking techniques that we have available to us in the laboratory. This is physiological dormancy, which has been caused when the seed has been taken off on slightly immature side. So it's been taken off too early. And this is typical of what we experienced um, in the fall of last year. 
And one of the frequently asked questions we've had so far this year is, can dormancy still be broken um, before seeding? And usually, as I say, it can be. But this year, because the dormancy has been so deep, we've struggled to actually get that dormancy to break. And it's very important that we do get that dormancy to break because if it's left not um, identified as to what's causing the dormancy, dormancy can actually hide a number of issues that may be going on or underlying with the seed. And that can be things like frost and chemical injury and those types of things. Now, in Canada, we have to follow the CFIA method for germination. So we follow the methods and procedures, and we are given methods and procedures that are prescribed for breaking dormancy. And this year, those methods haven't necessarily worked for us. Early on, we used our typical breaking dormancy technique of a pre-chill, which is really all we're allowed to do initially. And until we can actually demonstrate that we haven't been successful with breaking dormancy that way, it's not until then that we can actually add chemicals. And there's two chemicals that are available to us, and one of them is potassium nitrate, which actually is prescribed. And again, not in every case did that actually work. And it wasn't until we brought on gibberellic acid um, much later in the season and incorporated that with a dormancy breaking pre-chill period that we were able to actually in some cases successfully get the germination that we needed. Now we're back down to a more um, suitable or usual dormancy breaking technique of um, three to five days in, in the pre-chill chamber at seven degrees and then sometimes we're using potassium nitrate and sometimes we're not depending on the crop kind that we're dealing with. I cannot stress enough um, how dormancy um, must be broken because this year we've found that if we weren't, as I say, successful doing that, we found problems such as frost that have shown up later on after um, subsequent testing later in the season, or we found that there's been some hidden chemical injury that didn't show itself because we couldn't get a full germination on it. I'd also like at this point to um, mention that an analyst's responsibility is to get the best possible results that we can. And that's actually our creed. Um, it is our responsibility to protect the livelihood of our customers. And in that, when you get a result from any lab, that is the best possible result that we can get at that given time. We cannot guarantee a germination because it's live material and it cannot um, always stay stable. And in this year, a lot of our, our samples have not been stable. We've not been able to say that the germination can remain high all throughout the season. This is our cold stress test, and this is actually on a wheat. The cold stress test is actually a vigor test uh, to some people as well. Now, this is a test that was developed by Dr. Elmer Stobie. Um, he was a researcher and scientist out of Manitoba, and he developed a, a vigor test that's been used for many, many years uh, throughout the prairies on wheat and barley. One of the things that's been happening this year is that we've been getting a high germination and a low vigor. Very, very common on durum wheat and wheat this year and also to some extent on barley as well. Now here you can see on the left hand side there is an abundance of growth. Lots and lots and lots of good roots developing all the seminal roots are there. Usually we, we like to see three, but um, we'll accept two in a vigor test. But you can see how this 
sample on the left hand side that's gone through the same stress as the sample on the right hand side um, hasn't struggled at all. There's no dormancy here whatsoever and it's a very, very high vigor. On this test on the right hand side there are other issues as well as dormancy but predominantly it is dormancy that is an issue on this test. And you would expect, because this test has been conducted at 6 degrees for 12 days, that if there was any dormancy present, we wouldn't see it. And I'll just draw here, um, oops, there we go, dormancy. That's what it looks like. It's when the seed um, has imbibed water but hasn't got the capability of developing roots or shoots. And as I was saying, with the dormancy um, at 6 degrees, you would expect it to not be present. But we're actually finding that dormancy can be induced by temperature. So what does this mean to a producer who has a high germination and a low vigor because of dormancy? How does he go about seeding this product? Should he even be using it at all? My best answer for this is that we um, make sure that when we're recommending 6 degrees as being the temperature that you should be seeding into, because this is what we're emulating here, um, to avoid 6 degrees soil temperatures for seeding, because we know that that's creating part of the dormancy. We know that we can get it to grow at optimum conditions, but seldom do we get optimum conditions in the field. So obviously we need to be thinking about somewhere around 10 degrees. And we do not want to change our methods in the lab. Um, we cannot um, incorporate a new test procedure into the lab, say at 10 degrees, to make sure that this seed will grow at 10, because in essence, this the, the protocols have to be evaluated and that type of thing. But we do know from past experience that temperature definitely does induce dormancy. And if we avoid the 6 degrees and we go a little warmer, close to the germination, I think we would avoid that dormancy. Now, this slide shows typical seed issues from 2010. And this is, in my mind, a dog's breakfast. To any seed analyst looking at this, they would absolutely have a heyday. There's everything, every symptom that we see in a poor growing season. We have frost, we have disease, we have dormancy, all the, all the different things rolled into one. And very little of this seed actually is normal. And this has been fairly typical of what we've seen this year. And unfortunately, you would not know this until you actually tested it through an accredited lab that these symptoms were with this seed or, or moving along with this seed. And at this point, I'd like to say that um, the $20 that is spent on a germination is the best insurance that a, a producer can get to make sure that he has a good germination and therefore get a good stand establishment. We like to suggest that more than a germination is tested. Um, it's important to um, have other, other tests done, such as a vigor and a disease screen. But naturally, with this germination, we wouldn't want our grower or our client to continue on further. Now this shows you again frost and heating and we're going to spend a little bit of time on frost because we've had frost issues in previous years but this year we've had more frost issues than we've had before and it's definitely a topic that's not understood and we've had a number of different questions about whether seed treatment will actually help frost damage and those types of things and as I go through the next series of slides um, bear with me because often they show the same thing, um, but the point that I, I do want to make is that 
if we ever make a note on our report of analysis that frost damage is present, regardless of the amount of frost damage that's present, please, please consider either getting alternative seed or retest later on in the season. What I'd like to show you here is this is a classic example of frost damage. We have no um, coleoptile here, so no green leaf and no root. Very, very typical of a frost damage seedling with, with a grainy appearance to it. And over here, we have heating. And usually with heating, you can see um, little droplets of water developing on the seed which shows that it's actually sweating and that is because the seed has been binned with too much moisture and it's starting to starting to heat. If we catch it early enough we'll call, call our customer obviously and hopefully he can do something about that quickly and prevent further deterioration. But in this particular sample we do have a couple of different things that are wrong with it. Now, this one um, seedling here um, is indicative of severe frost damage. This here, where it's twisted, is not so bad. And it's actually considered to be normal um, if, if it's twisted a little bit like this. And as long as it's got roots at the bottom, then it would be considered to be normal. Now, we would make an, a note that this actually does have frost damage, but because it's not so severe, we're allowed to consider it and classify it as a normal seedling, but it could end up being like this seed later on throughout the season. This is a, a classic example of frost damage on barley seedlings. These are particularly bad. The one along the top here is normal, perfectly normal, good strong roots, good strong shoots, but the other five along the bottom are very, very good textbook examples of frost damage. And we have um, all of these in our samples from time to time. This is frost damage on wheat, and you can see here that uh, the um, roots are struggling here, and we actually have very little um, coleoptile or colorizer development. This is oats with frost damage and fusarium, another com combination that we've seen fairly frequently. And oats are typically very prone to frost damage. And you can see the red spots here are indicative of fusarium species. Now, as analysts, we don't have to identify the fusarium. We would only note it as a possibility that we think it's potentially fusarium. And if you're lucky enough, like us, to have a disease diagnostician on staff, um, we then take it over to her and she will identify this um, positively for us um, and we can make our diagnosis from there. With frost, um, you can see it's typically very, very severe. We have very little development at all, just really root development and that's essentially um, all that we have here. None of this would be considered to be normal. Frost damage close up on the oats, and you can see here that it's actually killed the seed. We've already got um, black uh, specks here, which is indic indicative of necrotic tissue forming, and we really have no um, growth here whatsoever, and none of these seeds would be considered normal. Moving along to chemical injury and dormancy, quite a rarity, but um, again, um, just shows you some of the struggles that we've had with uh, the quality of our crops coming in this year. Now here we've got uh, a little bit of chemical injury, injury which is usually caused by 
um, using a, a pre-harvest desiccant a little bit too early. And there are some products on the market that are very safe, and if they're used in a timely fashion, don't create any issues whatsoever. Um, but in this case, we do have some that's um, fairly prominent, and then of course we have the dormancy as well. And the dormancy is fairly obvious to see here. Um, and you can see the odd root um, that actually is affected with the uh, chemical injury. Now what happens here is that we have to retest in soil. CFIA give us one um, procedure, and that is to use the blotter. But if we do find chemical injury, we do need to see if we can improve the germination and retest in soil. And this gives you an example here of what chemical damage looks like close up. Have the healthy seedling on the right and the chemically damaged one on the left. And you can see that the chemical damage affects the root development. And we would recommend you not use this seed if we find any chemical damage present. Diseases have been paramount this year, and we've got lots of root rot here showing up on barley. Root rot is also known as cochleobolus sativus, and it's very common on barley. Um, when we make our evaluations in the laboratory, um, because we're not disease analysts, and here is an example of what it would look like, again, we don't make a positive identification, and we send it over to our disease diagnostician, who will make that identification for us. This year we've had very high infections um, on some of our samples, but nothing more than previous years. Here you can see how the root rot on a primary infected seedling can actually affect the other seedling next to it and cause secondary infection. And in this case, we would have to consider one of these abnormal and the other not abnormal. The only time we call them abnormal, actually, is when the disease has actually got right through into the conductive tissue and it's rendered it incapable of growth. This particular sample, because of its high germination capability, is a good contender for seed treatment. Again, diseases being very prevalent this year. This is a sample of Durham wheat. And here we have very, very high infection of Fusarium. And this is classic of seed that is coming from what we call the hotspot from southern Alberta, where we're seeing um, lots of Fusarium infection. And unfortunately, this has created a lot of problems with this germination. And even um, if we were to retest it, there'd be very, very little improvement. Again, we know that it's fusarium because there's, we know that it's fusarium species because there's the pink colonies on the blotter, but again, cannot make a positive identification unless it's actually had a plate or DNA test for fusarium or it's been checked by our disease diagnostician. One of the tests that we do frequently is a fungal screen. And this fungal screen um, offers our clients a more in-depth look at some of the diseases that are present on their seed. Um, the more pathogenic type species that we would see are Pyronophora, Fusarium species, Septoria, and Cochleobolus. And some of the less pathogenic would be Alternaria, Cladosporium, and Epicoccum. Now, I'm no expert, but knowing that uh, Fusarium looks pink, I would take a guess that um, that's Fusarium species. And then you can see by the different colonies that we've got a number of different issues with this seed. At this point, this, when we give out the results with this test, it allows our clients to make a more informed decision about <clears throat> excuse me, the quality of their seed. It also allows our clients to make a more informed decision about the 
type of seed treatment um, that they may want to select. This is a sample of wheat that actually was part of a study that we, we have conducted um, this year with a seed treatment. Just a quick look here shows you that we've got a couple of different colonies where the seed's been infected with a disease. Again, not a severe pathogenic type, but something that can be cleaned up very, very quickly and easily with seed treatment. And I'll show you quickly there. It's the same seed that's been treated with, with seed, seed treatments that's known to um, take care and control this particular pathogen. What I'd like to point out is that um, when you decide to use a seed treatment, you select seed that has a high germination and it's only um, the disease that's causing um, some some issues with the germination and if it's um, something that can be controlled with a registered product then we certainly suggest that um, that be something that's considered with the lack of seed um, that's around this year. We certainly suggest with the forecast for this year being a wetter, cooler spring because of saturated soils and the slower uh, snow melt that we're going to experience, we would certainly want people to use a seed treatment um, to protect the investment that they have already. Another question that we're often asked is, does pink colored seed automatically mean that my seed is infected with fusarium? And the quick answer to that is no. Um, again, I'm not looking at this as a, a real sample, but to my trained eye, I can't necessarily see a difference. We actually have four different pathogens that are causing shrunken seed on these dishes. So here we have Pyronotherum, Fusarium, Epicoccum, and Epicoccum and Septoria. So when we have that pink seed, it doesn't automatically mean that Fusarium is present. And what we would suggest is that to ensure that you find out whether it's there or not is naturally have it tested with either the plate test or the Fusarium test, I beg your pardon, or the DNA test. Moving on to peas, we do quite a lot of peas um, at our laboratory and for the most part um, they've been fairly stable. This actually is a good example of how we would conduct our um, germination. We've got good root and shoot development here and just the odd seedling has Ascochyta. And again, um, because we're seed analysts we cannot actually report that unless we actually have it um, positively identified with our disease diagnostician. And here this shows you the different colonies that we would expect to see in the presence of Ascochyta. Um, very, very um, symptomatic, um, easily identified to the trained eye that is, um, when you see this on a petri dish. In in a media that's known to promote the growth of Ascochyta. And here we just see it a little closer up. And here you can see a number of spores that indicate that this is Ascochyta. Glyphosate damage. Now this, again, as I mentioned, is when we've had samples that have been desiccated with a pre-harvest desiccation. Um, again, this is something that we would see um, when it's been treated or applied too early. It seems that one of the products when applied too early um, can, and I'm talking about glyphosate, can cause root damage. And here you can see very short stunted um, secondary roots, which is very, very classic of glyphosate damage. Again, in this case, 
we would suggest that a soil uh, test be conducted because in, in any situation where we do have chemical damage, we do have to go into soil. Now we've borrowed these uh, slides courtesy of uh, Ted Laboon at Syngenta. But this is some work that we did uh, in preparation for the Applied Agronomy Conference in Olds College in 2009. And what this shows you um, is healthy, mechanically damaged and heated seed with no seed treatment and seed treatment Cruiser Max for pulses placed into soil that has pythium and fusarium in a warm condition. So into optimum conditions, these seeds were placed. And you see the check for the sample one here is 70% germination on the healthy seed. That's the, the minimum, essentially, that we would want to see um, on, on peas. And you can see when it was treated in the same environment, we ended up with 95, oops, 95%. And again, with the mechanical damage, we wouldn't necessarily recommend that mechanically damaged seed be used because mechanically damaged seed ends, ends up actually decaying and causing more problems with the pythium. But here, with the seed treatment, we were able to get an additional 30% out of, out of the uh, seed quality. Um, and then with the heated seed, we had actually a very, very low germination of 0.5%, but when treated, it went to 50%. We would not recommend that this seed be used, and neither would we recommend that the mechanical damage seed be used. As I've previously said, we would only recommend that seed treatments be used in the case of seed that has a high performance for germination. This other slide, same sort of thing, exactly the same profile, but this time was placed in cold germination. And this is probably one of the most stressful environments that we can place peas into, and that's seven degrees for seven days, followed by five degrees at 21. And you can see here, with the seed treatment under cold conditions, virtually no emergence whatsoever. And then on the sample that had been treated with Cruiser Max for pulses under the same environment, we've actually got a remarkable emergence um, with the seed treatment. And this, can, this has happened time over time over time with experiments and research that we've done in the lab, proving that in the case when there is a reasonable germination, we can actually make an improvement. Again, this seed wouldn't necessarily be selected for growing in the field by any means, because we would never recommend that a 40% sample germination actually be used. One of the things that I would like to discuss is our report of seed analysis. And I cannot stress enough how important it is to read our report of analysis. This is typically uh, what our report looks like. Um, it will say what type of seed it is and what the lot number is and what the lab number is and the date that it was tested. Some of the most important things that are on the report, naturally. The next thing is the germination. And just to show you quickly, the germination on here is 94% and the abnormals are 6%. Now, this is what the front of our report of analysis looks like. The second slide shows that um, a little clearer what the front or the first page of our report looks like and the additional remarks will be on the second page so it's important in our case 
to read both sides or both pieces of our report. The germination in this case is 94 and the abs are 6. And the vigor on this is 65. And this is not something that we would typically expect to see. But in a year like this, um, it's not unusual. In our accredited remarks, we've put that our maximum germination potential was achieved before the final count. That means that we were able to count this off because actually it's an exceptionally good germination earlier than the germination prescribed period was. So if it's seven days, we were able to take this off at, at five days because we felt that no further evaluation would, is necessary and that no more seedlings would develop. We did extend the pre-chill um, to six days, which is the highest, not necessarily the highest we would go, but it is actually fairly high for this time of the year. And we did use potassium nitrate to break the dormancy. But the important thing is that even though there is a high germination, note the remarks. We noted that frost damage is suspected and that the abnormals are characterized by the grainy coleoptiles and the shedding of the leaf and the spiral twisting of the shoot. And those are the um, images that I showed you before. And it shows also, too, that some of the dead seeds had the darkened embryos and the decaying endosperm, which are all classic symptoms of frost damage. But the funny thing is that we observed dormancy in the vigor. So obviously, the frost, because frost can shut a crop down quickly, it made this particular sample immature. And therefore, when we tested the vigor on it, because we were stressing it, it brought that symptom out. So the important message to take home here is not only um, read the additional remarks on the ROSA, but also have more than just a germination test. Make sure that you do that vigor test, because your vigor test is closer to the truth in terms of what's actually happening with, with the crop. And in this particular year, I couldn't stress that enough. And this is a picture of another truck heading north, um, ready to take a load of canola that I just analyzed yesterday into Canada. And it will be leaving the port um, probably today or shortly. So. Um, look for that canola arriving. And I do want to stress before I leave you that um, this year particularly and any other year, always make sure that you keep a sample of your seed back on your farm just in case you have um, any you know, future concerns with it that you would need to uh, reference at a later uh, point in time. And we can always supply the, the sample bags for you if necessary. But um, a very important um, note that you should, should have. And be diligent with those seed treatments. Make sure that you get your seed tested. And make sure that you know what pathogens you have on the seed. And ensure that you've got all the information that you could possibly have. And with that, I'd like to leave you with a bright, sunny field. Thank you very much, Rick, um, for having me today. I hope that this has been informative and that um, those of you that are still listening um, find it useful um, for your future production. Thanks very much, Sarah. We do have some questions as well. And just a reminder to everyone, if you hit the little orange arrow, you'll open up your control pane and you can type some questions in there. Our first question comes from Don. It asks, what are the effects on germination on treated seed saved from last year? Good question. Usually, um, we would say, um, has a germination been conducted, a germination and um, vigor been conducted? Because that's obviously how we would first find out how that uh, seed is still doing in storage. 
the vigor would be very important on this particular sample. And I would say that if the seed had a high germination um, from last year, there'd be no negative impacts on having treatment on it. The seed treatments today are very, very safe. And if anything, um, I would expect that germination, assuming that the seed's been stored well, to be perfectly fine. Our next question comes from Murray. Murray wants to know, can we call the lab to get seed treatment recommendations and expectations? You certainly can call the lab. Um, what we would want to do is uh, conduct a fungal screen to find out what pathogens are present and then we would match up those pathogens with the label and make sure that you are purchasing a seed treatment that matches what you've actually found um, on the fungal screen. We're not tied to any one seed protectant company. Um, we certainly like to make a suggestion and we would do in-lab hand treating on any of the products that that client or Murray would like to, to try and that way we'd make sure that we're getting the right situation for you and that you're spending your money um, in the best possible way. Our next question comes from Kent. Kent says, many producers have been told by a malt company that their malt barley is dormant. They are told the TZ test is positive, but the 4 mil germ is only 70 to 85. What is the likelihood of this barley making malt, and what kind of time frame are we looking at? That's an excellent question. Um, gets into the science of dormancy, and I love those sorts of questions. Um, well, the TZ is a test that tests for viability. So obviously that entire sample is alive, but it has dormancy, which doesn't show up on the tetrazolium test. So malting barley actually has been designed to germinate very quickly and actually only has a, a very short shelf life. Um, so I wouldn't want to say that that seed would be any better today than it would be next year. Um, I think the only way that the dormancy could potentially be broken in that, and of course maltsters want something that's going to germinate very quickly, um, is by subjecting it either to, to cut, well actually to cold, and we've already had <laughs> enough cold um, in Canada to, to, to do that, so unless that seed's not stored outside, I, I really don't have any other suggestions on how that dormancy can be broken. Um, you're lucky in a sense that it is dormancy and it's nothing else. Um, I'm stumped on how long it would take because unfortunately with, with barley, molten barley particularly, as I say, it's got a very short shelf life and I think it needs to be used as soon as possible. Okay, our next question comes from Claude, who says, I went to a canola talk last week, and I was told that canola does not necessarily have to be in moisture to germinate, as the seed is able to gain humidity, which actually triggers germination when it reaches a certain level of humidity. He's wondering if wheat seed is the same. Hmm. <laughs> well... Seed does need humidity, there's no doubt about it, to germinate, but it needs consistent, um, it, it needs to be, in, once the seed has started imbibing water, it's essentially started its germination, and it needs to get continuous water to keep growing, especially at that early stage. I think it, it is true with canola that humidity can make it germinate, but it also depends on how much moisture there's already in the seed. Um, with wheat, it's a bigger seed. It takes a little bit more than just humidity to get it going. So I'd have to say that, um, just as an example, we have to give five mils of seed, for, well, five mils of water to a hundred seeds to get them to germinate. So I can't actually think that just humidity alone is enough. 
Okay, our next question comes from Keith. I'm led to believe vigor might normally be 10 to 15 percent lower than the germination results. You've indicated this year we are seeing a lot of samples with high germ and low vigor. I have a number of samples with 90 percent germ and 30 to 40 percent vigor. At what difference between vigor and germination percent would you use the vigor results to reject a seed lot for use? That's an excellent question and actually it's probably one of our most frequently asked questions this year. Okay, now because the seed has been germinated under optimum conditions, we know that the seed is capable of germinating. Now when we use a vigor test, we're actually testing it, um, as I said, either at 5 or 6 degrees, depending on whether it's wheat or barley, and we're simulating what actually happens in the field, because um, generally growers are trying to get seed into the ground as quickly as possible, so that's the given temperature that we've used to, to actually determine the level of vigor that's in that seed. Now, it's a, it's a real trick to understand um, what the seeding rate should be and whether you should, you should actually use the seed at all. And it is true, in normal years, we like to see a vigor no more than 15% less than the germination. This year we're dealing with seed that has you know, a, a much wider span than that. So what I'm going to say is look on the report because every case is different. Look on the report and see if they've said dormant present in, in the vigor. And if that's the case, we know that the trigger is temperature. And so if the, when you, you need to be seeding later. So what we would expect is that the later you seed, the closer you get to, what, to, to your germination. And that's, that's what we would recommend. If there's any other reason why that vigor is lower, such as frost or anything like that, and again, the, the germination would indicate that too, then I would say be very, very careful and still, still seed it because we know that that's the, the potential that's available on the germination, but again, seed a little bit later and into warmer soils. Okay, our next question comes from Wayne. In peas, and Ascochyta in particular, what is good, bad, and ugly in relation to infection percents and implications for crop yields and abilities to withstand issues in weather, temperature, moisture, etc., noting that seed treatment is not a preferred option? Okay. Um, Ascochyta is uh, not a... It's not a, a disease that's actually can, um, standardized in Canada. So there isn't a level that we know to be safe. Um, I think the industry standard is, especially um, in Saskatchewan, for example, is no more than 3%, I believe. And I think that would be a, a safe number that we would want to work with. Now, if I understood the question right, um, are you saying that you wouldn't want to use seed treatment, that the seed would be um, just seeded bare? If that's what I'm understanding, um, I certainly would not recommend that that seed be reseeded without seed treatment. Ascochyta um, notoriously affects the growing point. Um, of the seedling to the, to the seed and if you're going into a cold wet soil you, you're certainly setting yourself up for a failure. Hey, both Patrick and Jonathan are asking can you explain the process for properly taking a canola sample, a seed sample and storing it? Yes I can. I would like um, everyone to ensure that they keep a sample uh, stored for no less than a year, possibly two. It's always good to keep a reference. So that's one thing I would suggest in terms of the time. 
and this would be on, on all crops, not just on canola. The sample should be taken from various points of the bag and from there is actually a table that you can use to determine how many samples should be taken from each bag and how many bags should actually be taken. Uh, you would use the appropriate probe and you would fill a bag that's either a heavy duty Ziploc bag or we can provide bags with um, plastic lined and paper on the outside that seal very, very well. And it's important that the seed be put in that container or in that bag and sealed. Another container would be a Tupperware or plastic type box that's uh, rodent safe, that type of thing. Make sure that you package it well, it's stored in a cool place um, and that obviously you've got all the pertinent information with it. Uh, in terms of what it is and when you took the sample and that type of thing. But the, the most important thing in saving seed for future use is to make sure that it's in a moisture-proof bag, and that be um, a Ziploc-type bag, a heavy-duty um, freezer-type Ziploc bag. Okay, question from Hal. He wants to know, what does fresh refer to on a germ test? Good question. Fresh is like dormancy. Um, fresh is when the seed has taken the uh, taken on water, so it's imbibed water, and it just hasn't um, got the capability for one of various different reasons to actually um, germinate. So it's in the same category as dormant, um, but it's it shows that it's fresh because it's not. Um, decaying. It can sit um, as a plump kernel or a plump seed um, full of water almost wanting to, um, to germinate but cannot and that's the term that we use for fresh seed. Cameron wants to know what does the fungal screen cost? Oh. I don't have a price list in front of me. Okay, I'll give you the 1-800 number, uh, toll-free number. Um, good question. Um, it's 1-877-420-2099. And by all means, um, give Susan a call, and she'll give you the price. But I think it's around $100, and Barry will kill me for not knowing this. <laughs> I'll put the, your number up on the screen here in a second. Uh, and a Thank sort of a two-part question from Michael wants to know, uh, uh, just hang on, is the uh, situation similar across the prairies, wondering if seed quality differs across Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Alberta, and what fusarium looks like in Manitoba and eastern Saskatchewan this year? Oh, good question. Um, it's pretty much across the prairies. Um, some of you may know uh, Bruce Carrier from Discovery Labs in uh, Saskatoon. He's reporting similar, if not worse, um, situations with their germinations, particularly on disease. And um, I've not really heard too much from Manitoba, but just from our experience, um, their disease pressure is, is fairly um, strong. You know, on the bright side, um, it's not all doom and gloom. There are pockets where there's seed that is very, very good. And, you know, we've, we're still seeing seed now that's coming in for a second round of testing that has exceptionally good germination. But um, this, this is not some, something that we, it's just Alberta that uh, we, has been subjected to this, this challenging situation. Mm. I was muted. Uh, question from Keith. In the push for higher oil content in canola and the result being a thinner seed coat and with oil meaning energy for the young seedling, 
Does this help with germination and emergence? Um, that's, I'm not a geneticist, but um, I have had that question popped before. And um, I'd have to say with a thinner seed coat, you would expect that you know, the radical can protrude a lot quicker. Um, the oil doesn't give the seed energy for germination. Um, it's a different series of uh, chemicals that are responsible. It's more the enzymes and the proteins and the sugars and the starches that are responsible for um, the energy in the seed. But I think um, it's important to remember that, um, yes, there is a big push, absolutely right, for more oil in the seed. And um, today's canola is so much better, so much stronger, so much more you know, vibrant than it's ever been um, before. And whether it's a, a thin seed coat or a, a thicker seed coat, um, you know, the, the quality is so much dependent more on the environment that the seed has been um, subjected to prior to harvest. All right, well, that's the end of our questions. So on behalf of everyone who stayed right till the very end here for today's webinar, thank you very much, Sarah, for joining us all the way from Chile for today's webinar. Uh, just a reminder that we would like you to fill out the short evaluation at the end, and then uh, you can catch this uh, on the recorded version on our website, as well as uh, send people over for a link to that. So on behalf of uh, ourselves, the Alberta Canola Producers Commission, the Alberta Pulse Growers, and the Alberta Barley Commission, thank you again, Sarah. And thank you, everyone, for attending today. Uh, the webinar is now over, and have a great day.